All right, Shalom. Shalom Rastafari. This is our 37th uh, sabbatical study, um, the RSS, Rastafari Sabbath study or sabbatical scrolls. We can also call it um, Senbet Salam Shabbat Shalom. Senbet Salam would be more proper greeting in the Amharic for Shabbat Shalom, which is the Hebrew, which is to say sabbatical peace or a peaceful Sabbath. Uh, a salutation, a greeting, um, one can say a, a word of um, blessing to ones and ones who remember the Sabbath and keep the Sabbath, the Shabbat, the Senbet set apart. So what we're going to touch on right here is the continuation of where we left off from the previous portion that we posted up there. And the 37th or 39th actually, the 39th I think if I'm correct, the 37th actually plays a role in this as well because um, there are eight points up here and let's just look at 30, 30, uh, 37th again because in the 37th, if we're correct, um, a couple of chapters previously is where Moses' um, wife was spoken against, his Ethiopian wife was spoken against by Aaron and Miriam. And now in this particular sabbatical portion, I know it's chapter 12, let's see if this is it. Um, in this particular sabbatical portion, well, actually, that would be the 36th portion, where Aaron and Aaron and his sister um, Miriam speaks against um, Moses' Ethiopian wife. Chapter 12 of 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 this particular book, this present book, the book of um, the book of Numbers. Now, there are there are eight matters to be addressed in this, namely. The red heifer, um, Miriam's death, the water from a rock, or we could say water from the rock. Uh, fourthly, is the emissary to Edom when the Israelites were seeking to pass through the land of Edom to get to the promised land, and they were denied by their their brother, a tribe, the Edomites. And there's a very important connection right here when we talk about black, so-called black and Jewish relationships, you understand, in this present time, you know, with Esau and Jacob and the similarity as well as the differences between the two. There's a mystery um, in that relationship of so-called blacks and Jews. But the scripture, actually, the Torah discloses for us if we will study and show ourselves approved to God as work man that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, Aaron also dies, so Miriam's death takes place in this Torah portion, and Aaron's death also takes place in this 39th Torah portion known as Chukat, Chukat, or Yehigul Te'izaz, Yehino, Bamarinya, Yehigu of the Lord. So the word Higu, that we're going to get into the etymology of that, but hak or hok, hukat, the word hak, etymologically, is similar to the Ethiopic word hug, hug. The word hug and hak are similar etymologically right there. And there's a, there's a wonderful, um, 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 not mystery so much, but it discloses this word that in this portion means decree because this particular portion is concerning the decree concerning the red heifer. And this is the first matter that we would like to touch on. But just going over this again, there's, there's a victory over Arad. So there's a, there's a march, one of the Israelite marches, you know, um, against um, one of the tribes, Arad. We can learn from that. And the serpents, there's the brazen serpents as well, that takes place in this particular portion. And eighth, there's the victories over Sihon and Og, over Sihon and Og, and that also is very, very um, important, and connect with this Psalm 83, if I'm correct, Psalm 83, Psalm 83. Now, let's deal with the red heifer for a moment, the red heifer. 
what is this red heifer all about? What what is this portion about the red heifer? Let's let's get the scriptures, bring the scriptures. Now we have some additional um reference materials as well. Most of these are available um at the present time for purchase, although some of the documentation can be found on the internet, you know, if one searches it out. But we have we have the Ethiopic legends of Our Lady Mary, and something very interesting the Holy Spirit turned me to um, concerning Mary and the name Mariam. And I think this is very, very important, as well as the name Hannah, the name Hannah, who is the mother of Kedistengel Mariam, the mother of our Black Lord and Savior Yeshua HaMoshia. Now, we utilize this particular book, you know, the Midbar. And then we have the Ethiopic Torah, the Orit, which is in the Gutters. You understand? Which is in the, the Gutters. And we're, we're probably going to begin from here after we go over the first couple of verses in, in the Schofield um, Reference Bible. So hopefully you have your Schofield Reference Bible. So grab your pen and your paper, your sacred scripture, and bring a willing and attentive mind. In the conformity of our Black Lord and Savior Yeshua HaMashiach, the glory of Kedus Abatachin. So we're going to begin from chapter. This portion right here. We're going to begin from chapter um, 19. Let's go to chapter 19. All right, chapter 19. So we're still in the years. We're still in the years. What's called the years of wandering. The years of wandering. Right, and now here is the ordinance. Here's the ordinance or hukat yehigu tizaz, which means of the law or the decree, a commandment of the decree or a commandment of the law. Um, this is this is translated here. This is the ordinance of the law. So an ordinance yehigu tizaz yehidno. This is a hukat. This is an ordinance of the law. So it begins off, verse 1, and Yahweh and the Lord, but Yahweh, yod hey wow hey or ekezi aviher bamarinya lotu subhat, to him be the praise, spake to Moses and Aaron, saying, this is the ordinance of the law, which Yahweh, yod hey wow hey hath commanded, saying, speak to the children of Israel. Speak to the Dekika Israel, the, the, the Bani Yishrael, that they bring thee a red heifer without spot, wherein is no blemish, and upon which never came yoke, and upon which never came a yoke. And it says, And ye shall give her to Eleazar the priest, that he may bring her her, make note of that, her forth without the camp, outside of the camp. And one shall slay her before his face. Now, remember, we're dealing with the Balui Kidan, we're dealing with the Old Covenant, but it's important to understand the Old Covenant in the light or the illumination of the New. This is why in the New Testament it says that, that veil, you see many of our Hebrew and Jewish people, when they read this, they still have the veil. There's a veil over their eyes. Some even think that these ordinances, we are to continue to do these things, but these things are done away with in the Moshiach. They're done away with in Jesus Christos. And now the explication of what was the meaning of these things, these sacrifices, these ordinances, you understand? And how were they fulfilled in Yeshua? How were they fulfilled in our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? That's the point of our study. That's the point of even this lesson here on the red heifer. So here it says in verse 4, And Eleazar, the priest, the Kohen, or the Kahin, shall take of her blood, emphasize her right there, her blood, with his finger, and sprinkle of her blood directly before the tabernacle, the tent, the dinquan, the mishkan of the congregation seven times. Seven times. So let's make note of these key factors. First of all, the red heifer, it is not a male, it is not a male 
um, heifer, there's no such thing. Basically, the male will be the bull, right? The male will be the bull. Now, as we said before, we need to remind our brothers and sisters in this present time, the only way we can fully, really understand this is to put it in the context, the historical context of its time, and we have to link it with Egypt. You'll see the secret of this comes out of Egypt, but the root of Egypt being a colony of ancient Tobia or Ethiopia, the root of it is Ethiopian. This is this this is the key. Remember when 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 Aaron and and Miriam spoke against Moses' Ethiopian wife. Remember what happened to Miriam. You know, saying with the the sign of leprosy. Now it's interesting the sign of leprosy, because leprosy is also linking now with this racial matter that causes so much consternation amongst men and people, this whole racial black and white, you know, this, this whole black and white thing going on, black Jews, white Jews, so forth and so on. But the scripture discloses it very carefully and very interestingly for us because in the scriptures we find Moses, you remember the scene in, 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 in Shemot, in Orit Zetzat, the Hebrew book of, of, of Exodus, where Moses took his hand and he put his hand in his bosom, and when he pulled it out, it, it turned leprous, white, you understand? White as snow, in other words, his, his hand turned like the hand of a white man. Well, how could that be unless he was not white? So, therefore, that discloses that a lot of what we have seen in the movies, Ten Commandment movies, and in Hollywood is a lie. You understand? It's a lie for one major reason, and that is the humanity. It's not putting putting in its right context. So when we see these movies about ancient Egypt and people argue about whether Egypt was white or black, all these things are, 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 are nonsense because the evidence speaks for itself. You understand? And what we're going to also seek to do in this particular um, 39th portion is uh, show some other vids that we have come across. One particular very interesting video, I actually want to check it out again. I've checked out certain parts of its name, the Pyramid Code, and we're going to have that available at our website, and it's out there. Some of you might know of this particular video, the Pyramid Code, and it really blows the cover on a lot of the cover up concerning ancient Egypt. And there's a couple of key points that we want to link and dovetail with these teaching right here. In order for us to really understand well, what is this red heifer all about? You understand what is this red heifer? And then we're going to see that this red heifer and the ritual that's disclosed right here in chapter 19 of the book of Numbers, or Bamidbar, was also done in ancient Egypt. So, so, so we're seeing the whole context of this properly interpreted. It has to come out of Egypt from its true African or Afro-Shemitic roots. All right, so the para, the para aduma, it's called the para aduma, right? The para aduma or the red heifer. Now, what's interesting too is the link with the red heifer and the calf, like the calf. You remember the whole golden calf incident. That's also, there's a very um, important Egyptian link. So in the time that this was written and understood by the native or the ethnic Hebrews, they understood the context of this. Now today, when we read it with so much, you know, um, make-believe and movies and false histories and everything, it becomes very confusing. You understand, know what, what, what is about this? It sounds like some ritual that tribal African people would do because it was a ritual out of the root of humanity out of Africa, you understand? And the keys for us are disclosed through ancient Egypt concerning this, you understand? Utilizing our Ethiopic reference points, you understand, as a reference to put all this matter into its proper context. And hopefully we'll have an opportunity to at least touch on some of the basics, to explicate some of the basics so that it's a little more clearer you understand, for you all as it has become clear for I and I. All right, so it says, and one shall burn the heifer. So now the heifer gets burnt in his sight, in the pre-sight. It says her skin 
and her flesh and her blood with her dung. That means with her shit. With her dung. D-U-N-G. You know what I'm saying? It's S-H-I-T. Today we say S-H-I-T. Then they said D-U-N-G. You know what I'm saying? So the Lord does not have any kind of false, you know, any kind of false sense of, you know, like people now, they say, if you say the word shit, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, oh, you know, that's why people can't overstand the simplicity of this. You know what I'm saying? Shall he burn. So all of this is to be burned, and the priest shall take feather wood or cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast it into the midst of the burning of the heifer. Then the priest shall wash his clothes. Now, after this particular ritual, the, the priest, the kohen, or the kohen, the kohen, he shall wash his clothes, it says, and he shall bathe his flesh in water. And afterward, he shall come into the camp, and the priest shall be unclean. He shall be ritually unclean until the evening. You understand? Know until the evening. Remember, evening and morning is one day. So the Shabbat for us begins not on Saturday so much, but on Friday even, you know, or evening. So it says that the priest who now performs this, Eleazar, it says right here, he shall be unclean, ritually impure, urkus, rikus, until the even. And a man that is clean shall gather. Now it says, now another man who is clean, who had no part of this, and, and, and is not ritually um, defiled in any other way, that is clean, shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and lay them up without the camp in a clean place. And it shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel. Now, this shall be put in a, a clean man is going to gather this up, right, the ashes of the heifer, and lay them up without, outside of the camp, not within the camp, but outside of the camp in a clean place. Right? And it shall be kept. It shall be protected, kept, reserved, right? For the congregation, for the machiber, or the congregation, or the society. When we say society, it's that very same word that we have here as congregation. For the congregation, or the, the society of the children of Israel, for a, it says, now here's the key, for a water, right, for a water of separation. Now, don't confuse water separation with the water from the rock, but the key thing is the water element. So now the elements, the elements that are being disclosed right here, the water element, right? It is a purification for sin. It said that this is a purification for chatiyat, for the missing of the mark of righteousness or sin. And he that gathereth the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes. So now the one who gathered these ash, the ashes of the heifer also must wash his clothes and be unclean, be unclean until the even. So even him shall be unclean now after doing this deed until the even, the evening time. And it says, it shall be to the children of Israel and to the stranger, the stranger that sojourneth among them for a statute, a statute, not a, not a statue, you know what I'm saying, but a statute, right, a statute, speaking legally, speaking forever, like an ordinance, it shall be for an ordinance forever, so it says that this is for both the children of Israel, to say the, the, the ethnic, you know what I'm saying, Hebrews or, or those who are of the race, so it's like today when we talk about Gentiles, or European, or white rice, or non-African, black, you know, non-African, or uh, Afro ones, so, so non-black, to say white, or strangers, or from other nations, that wasn't part of these same peoples that came over here in the transatlantic, you understand, the trans-so-called Ethiopic Ocean slave trade, you know, who may be Rastafari. So when it says stranger, those of you all, and of of the Gentiles, make note of this right here, because some folks, 
will say, well, there's no place for the stranger. This is like just a black thing. That's not really correct. Yes, the foundation, like based on the eye teaching of his majesty, as we taught it before, you have the eye, and you have the, 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 the pupil of the eye, and then you have the solera, the white part of the eye. You see how that is balanced? That is the same way that Jah also balances it. He doesn't exclude so-called the righteous Gentiles, but he doesn't put them in the position of the righteous Ethiopians or the righteous Hebrews. It's like on the eye. If you have a white part on the black part, you have a pro it, there's a problem in your vision. It affects your vision. But if there's a black part on the white part, the eye still has mobility. The solera still can move around. But if you have a white part on the black part of the pupil, you understand that he says he loves us as the pupil. We are he who touches his children as they touch the pupil of his eye. They affect the vision. You understand? So it's about order. You understand? So we speak about Rastafari, black Rastafari, and non-black Rastafari. It's about Jah's order. So we have to learn and understand in Christ, in spirit, and in truth that particular order. All right. So it says it shall be to the children of Israel. And to the stranger that sojourneth amongst them, those who dwell amongst us. So, yes, there would be strangers or non, we could say blacks, in other words, amongst us, even as righteous Rastafari and Ethiopian Hebrews. But it's according to Jah's order. You know, say not according to our feelings or emotion or mixed up moods and attitudes. No, it's according to Jah's order. Yovas. So verse 11 says, He that toucheth the dead body of any man shall be unclean seven days, and he shall purify himself with it on the third day, and on the seventh day he shall be clean. But if he purify not himself the third day, then the seventh day he shall not be clean. So it's, it's interesting, this, this numbering thing is saying it's on the third day. The, Three, Trinity, in a sense. If he don't do it on that particular day, then when the seven comes, he will not be clean. Now, even though this is the Old Testament, this is a, a physical ritual here in the killing of the, of, the, of the red heifer and in the burning of the different parts of it, the gathering of the ashes, so forth and so on. There is a spiritual, you know, and there's a spiritual lesson to be learned from it. Now, that is the key. That's what those who are without Christ and read the Old Testament, they lack that. So they think that this is an actual ritual that must still be done, but that has been done away with through our black Lord and Savior, Shua HaMoshiach. All right? Now, here it says in verse 13, Whosoever toucheth the dead body of any man that is dead and purifieth not himself, defileth the tabernacle of Yahweh. This is, this is the interesting thing. It says that we are, don't, do you not know that ye are the tabernacle of the Most High? You're saying that even I and I, body is to be like, like unto the tabernacle, a place for his spirit to dwell in. So we see the tabernacle being on a certain level the, the, the macrocosm, and individually each of I and I being like the micro. Cosm. And here's a kind of a key right here in the verse, verse 13. Whosoever toucheth the dead body of any man that is dead and purifieth not himself, if he don't purifieth himself, he defileth the tabernacle of yod hey wow hey of Yahweh baruch hu, blessed be he, and that soul. Notice what it says. They don't say that body. They don't say that spirit. You know, it says that soul, that suke, that psyche. What is the soul? The soul is, is, is our feeling, our thought, our emotion, our mind, our will. Our will is all contained in what is known as the, the nest in the Bamarinya and in the, the Gutters, Ethiopic, in the Hebrew, it's the nefesh. So we have nest, nefesh. In the Greek, we have suke, from which we get the word psyche, or like psycho-psychological. So that psychological state shall be cut off. If it's defiled, it is cut off from Israel. So now we can expand even on that, that those who are defiled in, that, in, in their consciousness are cut off from this. So it's like when we say, yes, the lost sheep of the house of Israel are black, but not all black people truly are Israel. Like, say, you may be my color, 
but you're not my kind. But why is that? Because of the soul. You see, the defilement right there, there's a cutoff. There's a cutoff from Israel. Now, on the spiritual level, there's a cutoff from spiritual Israel. Because the water of separation, notice this, why? Because the water of separation, what is this? The water of separation. So we, we speak about Kiddus, Kiddusana, to be holy. We speak about the Nazarite vow. You always saying separate thyself to Yahweh. You always saying those who separate. So the whole separation is an act of, 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 of holiness. You know, saying to be separate. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. So now here we have this water of separation. And when the water of separation, which in a sense is similar to the baptism, symbolically speaking, this water of separation, is when it's not sprinkled upon him, it says he shall be unclean. His uncleanness is yet upon him. His uncleanness is still upon him, no matter no, with whatever else he may try to do. That uncleanness is still upon him. That's why in the New Testament when, when it says about being baptized, he that believeth and is baptized, but he that, he that don't believe or don't have faith is already damned. But one who has faith, in other words, believeth or mameneth has true amen, must also be immersed, must be baptized. And that connection with water is very interesting, even right here. Now, this is just still the overview concerning the red heifer. We're just going through the verses right now, right? Going through these particular verses right here, right now. Now, verse 14 says, This is the law. When a man lieth in the tent, all that come into the tent, and all that is in the tent shall be unclean seven days. So it says that when that one is unclean because of being defiled with the dead, and with that dead body, that when that person was unclean, goes into a tent, then they, by their presence, defiles everything else. Now, there's a spiritual understanding that needs to be understood here. And every open vessel which hath no covering bound upon it is unclean. So even if that person goes in some place and there's an open cup or something, that is unclean too. You understand? And whosoever toucheth one that is slain with a sword in the open fields or a dead body or a bone of a man or a grave shall be unclean seven days. And for an unclean person, they shall take the ashes of the burnt heifer of purification for hatiyat and running water. Now I want you to make a note of that right there in verse in fact, the Holy Spirit says, just, just underline this right here, the running water in verse 17, and running water shall be put there to in a vessel. What kind of water? Is it stagnant pond water? No, it's running water. Is it water that you collect in the gutter? So, no, it's running water. Understand that. Running water. In other words, say living water. This is living water. Now, those who are in Yeshua... And, and strong and, and, and are strong in faith in Yeshua. That means overstand the word. You can see the links right here with the fulfillment in the Hadith Kidan. You overstand on the Burt Hadasha in the New Covenant, in the New Testament. This idea of water, this idea of baptism, this idea that even the baptism becometh as a, as a, as a separation. You overstand for the spiritual Israel. And a clean person shall take his up and dip it in the water, and sprinkle it upon the tent, and upon all the vessels, and upon all the persons that were there, and upon him that touches a bone, or one slain, or one dead, or a grave. And the clean person shall sprinkle upon the unclean on the third day, and on the seventh day, and on the seventh day he shall purify himself, and wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and shall be clean at even. And he shall be clean at the evening time. It's interesting when we study about the, um, the Beta Israel of Ethiopia, the Falashas. And I don't know how much uh, y'all or uh, any of y'all have studied about the Falashas, Beta Israel, but it's often said that um, there was like a little joke among some of the non 
Falasha, Beta Israel, Ethiopians, like, how can you tell a Falasha? Is that they always smell like water. You know, that was derisive or derogatory in certain periods of time, but really it kind of shows another perspective if we would interpret it from the word of Jah, from the word of God, from a Giziabi Herk Alat, concerning even the Falashas or Beta Israel keeping of this ancient Judaic practice of cleansiness. See, this is the key thing that's right here. Some would look at the ritual part and the heifer part, but you can see the water, the, clean, the cleansiness, this focus, this idea on that which is hygienic. You see, if there was more um, hygienicness in the world, there wouldn't be all these dangerous diseases out there, both the diseases of, 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 of body, but also diseases of, of soul, of psyche. Remember the connection with the soul, that soul shall be cut off from Beta Israel. Verse 20, but the man that shall be unclean and shall not purify himself, that soul, notice it say that soul, it didn't say that body, it says that soul, that psyche, that mind state, that emotion, that, that will, that, that thought amongst that person will be cut off. You're over saying almost like this fellowship in that sense. But the man that shall be unclean and shall not do what? What is the key thing? Purify himself. Now, this was the ritual in the old covenant of purification. Now, Yeshua HaMoshiach, he has upgraded this in the New Testament in the Hadith Kidan. So we do not have to do this same sort of ritual, but it's good for us to understand what was the context for the people of this time of this red heifer? What was the real underlying connection? Did it have any connection on where they were at in ancient Egypt? Can we look at ancient Egypt and see any correspondence or any connection with this? Yes, we can, and Jah willing, we will. Now, it says that the soul will be cut off from amongst the congregation because, why? Not just cut off because somebody might feel like I cut you off. No, it's because he has defiled the sanctuary. He has defiled the sanctuary, the Mekdes, the holy place of Igazi Abher Lotu Subhan, of the King of Kings, of Christ, of God. He has defiled the sanctuary of Yahweh. The water of separation hath not been sprinkled upon him. He is unclean. Right? Verse 21. 21 and 22 to conclude this chapter. And then we'll go through the red heifer, the footnotes right here, which now will begin to help us to understand it in the context of Yeshua. And it shall be a perpetual statute to him. A perpetual statute. That means a continual forever statute to them. And he that sprinkleth the water of separation shall wash his clothes. And he that toucheth the water of separation shall be unclean until even. So this is that one should, this is that one should, one that, that, that sprinkleth the water of separation, the one who sprinkles it, must wash the clothes. And he that toucheth the water of separation shall be unclean until the even. In other words, until the, the time of the sun going down, in other words. And whatsoever the unclean person toucheth shall be unclean. And the soul that toucheth it shall be unclean until even. The soul that touches it shall be unclean until even. Now, the first thing that this reminds me of on a certain level, the whole thing about clean and unclean, and we want to go to the, the New Testament for a moment and the book of Revelation. This is interesting right here in the book of Revelation, verse uh, chapter 22, and it's 22 verses to Numbers chapter 19, but here in chapter 22, it says, it says right here, it says, uh, verse, um, let's just go from verse, the last message of the Bible, chapter 22, from verse 8. It says, and I, John, or Johannes, Hannes, Hanna, means grace, yo, 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 Hannes, Johanna, Johannes, Johannes, um, means the grace of Yah, the grace of Jah, and I, John, Johannes, or the grace of Jah, 
saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the Melaach, the angel, which shewed me these things. Then he saith to me, See, thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant. I'm also a brethren, I'm a fellow servant. And of thy brethren, of thy brothers, the prophets, and of them which keep, which protect, which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. Worship the true God, right? Verse 10 says, And he saith to me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. So this is not like in Donnell. The book of Donnell, things were sealed up until that time. Here, he is told not to seal the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Verse 11, He that is unjust, he who is unrighteous, he who does not recognize our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, Hamoshir, is our righteousness. It is the only righteousness that is accepted as true righteousness before Abba Kedus, Kedus Abba Tachin, before his God, our God, before his Father, our Father, before the, the, the creator of heaven and earth and the sea and all that is therein. The triune God, it says, he that is unjust, how, how would you deal with one who don't want to receive the grace of Yeshua HaMoshiach, the word, the truth? It says, he that is unjust, that's one who's unjust, who don't want to receive Yeshua. It says, let him, let him be unjust still. Let him be unjust still. Don't fret yourself. He's made his decision. And he which is filthy, he which is filthy, Urku, so that's to say unclean in the Old Testament context, Filthy would be unclean. Let him be filthy still. So if ones are choosing in these last days to go with Babylon, you know what I'm saying, to go with the deception, delusion, let them be. And he that is righteous, one who accepts the true good news of the King of Kings and his Christ, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, caduce, holy, let him be caduce. Let him be holy still. Verse 12, and this is in the red letter, so this is the words of Christ. It says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments. Bless are they. Remember, this is Revelation. Some will tell you that the commandments are done away with. You, you hear some preachers, I mean, and some of them might be sincere, but many of them are sincerely wrong. Because right here, even in Revelation, it says, Bless are they that do his commandments, that do them. Not that talk about them or, or philosophers, but that those who do his commandments. So, what are his commandments? And that they may have right. That means right. We say, oh, I got rights, so they violated my rights. But what are our spiritual rights? It says, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, to the tree of life. So you hear folks talking about Kabbalah, Kabbalah, Kabbalah. But, but they, they don't have no right to the tree of life unless they do his commandments and may enter in through the what? Gates into the city. There's no other way to enter into that city except through the gates. Call them stargates if you will. There's no other way to enter in to that city except through the gates. For without, those who are outside, remember how all this was done with the red heifer outside? Remember he keeps saying outside, outside the camp, and this will be kept outside the camp, outside the camp. Now why is this why is this significant? Why is it significant? Well, let's go on. It says, for without our dogs. Outside of the city, the holy city, are dogs. Outside of the holy consciousness are ones who live like dogs, right? Dogs and sorcerers, pharmacists, you understand, the workers, and whoremongers. You, like we said, Satan don't have no problem about pushing pornography to your children, and, and he, he says it's just media, just allow them the right to choose, right, to choose 
to lose, and murderers, and murderers, and idolaters. Now people be watching American Idol, you know, so you be thinking like, wow, there really is a broad road that leads to destruction. And whosoever, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie, both the maker of the lie and those who love lies. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Verse 20 says, I, Yeshua, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. These are the things that they should be testifying to in the churches, but they're not. But here it says, I, Yeshua, or Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Uh-oh. You know, what, you know, a lot of folks be talking about, oh, the bright and morning star, this is some kind of Lucifer, Illuminati kind of so-called so thing. But I don't know what they're saying. I want to learn what Yeshua is saying right here. And don't you want to learn that? So stay tuned for the next part of this. We're going to go into the, a little bit more of the, the red heifer, get into the details of this red heifer. So stay tuned, brothers and sisters. Shalom Rastafari.